We do have a lot of information to look at tonight. We've gone through 30 individual references to the Apocrypha. And we've got a message or two to go and we'll be complete having finished our whole study that we intended to do from the New Testament times up until the 20th century. Now, what we had discussed last time was leading up to this major watershed. I hope you have your pencils and your papers ready. We have a lot of material. I didn't bring any preaching material tonight, just a lot of teaching historical material. It was leading up to the Council of Trent, so that's where we pick up tonight, a discussion of the Council of Trent. Uh, Trent Trent's unusual in many regards. Trent's probably, well, I don't know if I can say that. I'll put a, a qualifier in there. It's one of the churches, when I say church, I mean the whole visible Christendom, one of the church's most important most significant councils, one of the most significant that has ever been held before. I hate to say the most important because of all the earlier ones like the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon and Constantinople, but it's very, very important. Probably it's the most important, I guess I could say this, it's the most important in the second millennium of the Christian church. There were so many of them to begin with, the first of those being the Council at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 and the Council of Nicaea in 325 and Chalcedon and Constantinople in the next century, all that's taking place in the first thousand years of the history of the Christian church. But let's say from the start of the great division between the Eastern and the Western church in the year A.D. 1054, then from then until now, there has not been a greater council than the Council of Trent. Now, First Vatican... First Vatican in 1870 is important. We're going to get to that later on, but First Vatican... Um, well, it really just redefines and, and puts its stamp of approval upon what had already been passed as canon law from the Council of Trent back in the mid-16th century. Second Vatican of not that many years ago, just two decades ago, was also important, but not because of its originality, uh, because of some other things that were involved in Second Vatican. So anyway, the Council of Trent ran from 1545 to 16 to 1563. They were long, but I can't say 16, something that's a little bit too long. 1545 to 1563. So it's an 18-year-long council. Uh, to be a little more specific, from December the 13th of 1545 to December the 4th of 1563. So it ran from a December to a December. Now, I think in this church, we're all familiar with the name anyway, the Council of Trent, and maybe some who have studied it in Catholic schools are a little more familiar with it, but for the sake of the Protestants, former Protestants that are here, um, what can I say? Some people, Protestants, get misconceptions of what these councils were all about. The Catholics said it was the 19th Ecumenical Council of the Christian Church. Protestants were involved. There was an interaction in the Council of Trent with regard to the Protestants. It's just that whenever laws were passed that were contrary to the desires and thoughts of Protestants, and they asked for a redress of grievances, so to speak, and let's, you know, rehearse these things again, because it was controlled by the Catholics, because it was controlled by the Pope, then, of course, the, the Protestants didn't, didn't get their say-so, and let's have these things redone again and end up more with a biblical view of the matters. The council had been proposed many years before. You've got to remember back in this period of time, there was such a close interaction between the Roman Pope, the Roman Bishop, the Pope of the Catholic Church in Rome in the Vatican, and the various emperors of the world, whether we're talking about, well, Italy's really not a country then, so France or England or Germany. Uh, this is what just ridiculous it takes place in church history of the spats and the quarrels and the feuds that the popes have with various leaders like remember the one leader who the pope made him stand outside in the snow barefoot until he had repented of his sins he wouldn't even let the king the king the popes would control the kings well it didn't always work that way sometimes the kings tried to control the pope so because of some problems with king philip it was put off time and time and time again and finally it was convened December the 13th in 1545. But just because you have the years before you, 
don't think, as I guess many Protestants would, that this <laughs> ran on a consecutive daily or weekly or monthly or even a consecutive yearly basis. Because it didn't. You didn't have 365 day a year council for a period of 18 years. That would have probably even bored the people who took the minutes in the council to have that much last that long. Nor there'd be different periods. For the Tridentine Council, there were three periods known as that, the first period, the second period, and the third period of the council. And as a matter of fact, between the second and the third period, there was a decade lapse in time, 10 years from 1552 to 1562, before we come to the third phase of the council. So I give you a little history and then we'll get into it. The first period just ran for a couple of years, from 1545 to 1547. And it dealt with the first eight sessions. In other words, even a period, the first period of the Tridentine Council from 1545 to 1547 did not run on a daily consecutive basis even there but it was made up of eight different sessions. And a session would meet on a certain day and either last just that day or maybe go a few days after that, and then everyone would go home. And then a few months later, everyone would come back and more things were discussed. What we're concerned about is the fourth session of this first period, which we'll get to here in a moment. Then the second period ran from 1551 to 1552 and included session, sessions 9 through 14. It's very interesting to study. You see, that is in our point tonight, but it is very interesting to study all the mechanics of these councils. And then the third period ran from 1562. So see, we've had a 10-year lapse in time between the second and the third period to the final year, 1563, and included sessions 15 through 25. Now all of the background information that we studied last week really puts us in a ready place to begin to understand the farce of the Synod's decree. And it is just that. It's a counter-reformation reaction that's aimed at the teachings of the reformers. Because remember, thus far in history, we have looked at what the official position is of anyone, whether you're Protestant or Roman Catholic, or whether you are neither, or whether you come before the time. There were such neat little divisions as the Protestants and the Roman Catholics. We looked at uh, Jimenez, well, way back to the time of Pope Gregory, what his view was, what the view of uh, Cardinal Jimenez was, what the view of Kajitan was. Uh, all of these are illustrious names in Catholic history. And they're all on the, quote, Protestant side, unquote, because they're not in favor with the accepting of the Apocrypha on the same level as they were the Old Testament books. So remember what the Catholic theologians thought up until this time. There was a big difference between what was recognized on a scholarly, intellectual level by the leaders of whatever type of church we're talking about and what the average common person thought about the Apocrypha. We'll be reviewing some of that again. But remember, just because of the fact it was in the Bible, in the Bible of the people, whatever language we're talking about, and the chief language for most of them was Latin for a long time, because it was in Jerome's Vulgate, then the common people who didn't go to school, who didn't have the ability to learn or to know some insights like the leaders had, they don't know any better, but just to accept whatever's in their Bible before them. So it's interesting that all of a sudden, in other words, what the Council of Trent is going to do, you already know what type of decree they pass here. It's in favor of the Apocrypha. But what's so interesting is this is a total reversal to the whole history of the Catholic Church. And it's a total reversal to the whole history of the Protestant Church as well. There had been no one that existed prior to that time that was in total favor, not a scholar who knew better, that was in total favor of accepting the Apocrypha as canonical scripture. There was too much that had been said and too much that had been written before as far as scholarly treatises and studies were concerned for someone who had knowledge in these matters uh, to fall for such a blunder. 
people, scholars that did maybe include uh, one or two books or so on their list did it as an honest mistake, not because they actually recognized this to be on the same level as the Old Testament prophetic writings. So a little history now of what goes on here. We're concerned about the first period and the fourth session. This first period, I don't have a list and I don't know from memory all the things that the different sessions and periods dealt with, but I know this first period obviously dealt with such things as justification by faith versus justification by merit, which just struck a root at the whole heart of the Reformation. And they dealt with a lot of other things, such as the putting on the same plane of scripture and tradition. They were placed on the same plane with one another. As a matter of fact, I think that even took place during either the third or the fourth session. But the fourth session of the first period is dated April the 8th, 1546, where the decree of sacrosancta was passed, the sacred decree was passed with regard to tradition, scripture, and inclusion of the Apocrypha. Fifty-three prelates made up the committee, none of whom were distinguished at all for their historical expertise. Therefore, it really made them incapable on a scholarly level to make a decision one way or the other about the inclusion of the so-called apocryphal books. It's interesting that not a one of these 53 prelates was distinguished for his historical acumen. Now, the Apocrypha was accepted. We're going to give you all the details and a quotation of the decree of Sacrosanct in a moment. But the Apocrypha was accepted on the basis of expediency and not on the basis of evidence. Uh, this is what makes it such a religious farce in the history of the church. There's no doubt about that. As a matter of fact, after that, many... Catholic theologians had a very difficult time honestly dealing with the question because either you throw the Apocrypha out or you're going to throw the Pope out one or the other. To try to be in submission to the Pope when the Pope is in favor of the Apocrypha puts you in a very precarious position as a Catholic theologian or as a professor at a Catholic university when honestly and internally you're not in favor with the Apocrypha. But how can you come out and say something about that? When it costs you your church, it costs you your robes, it costs you your orders, it costs you, they felt their salvation to go against the teachings of the Holy Roman Father. The matter was settled on two bases. First of all, it was settled on the basis of existing usage, which doesn't prove anything. Now, this has been true with Catholics as well as Protestants up until this time as well as after this time. It was just the popular prevailing deed to use the Apocrypha in one's church services. And secondly, they just wanted to make an issue with the Protestants over this because the Protestants had made an issue with them. I really don't think, just to make sure we all understand from where I'm coming, I really don't think I'm making um, a farce of something that's not a farce or that I'm trying to just paint a stereotype of Catholicism and showing how stupid the Roman Catholics were at this time. I really think history in both sides of this question will bear it out whenever a person does study this. You could take the 53 prelates and study their life and see where they got their decree degrees from and what they were learned in and what they were not learned in. And they were not learned in their historical in historical areas, which one would have to be familiar with to know what the history of the church is, to know what Augustine's true opinion was, you see. A lot of people are yelling, let's go Augustine's way, Augustine's way, and accept the Apocrypha. Well, Augustine didn't. So what do you mean, let's go Augustine's way and accept the Apocrypha? He didn't accept the Apocrypha. But if you just want to read over some formal list from the Council of Carthage, then what you'll end up with is 44 books in the canon. You've got to do a little more reading besides just that. 
And you can only be an expert in so many areas, and that includes myself, that includes anybody. You can only be an expert in so many areas. Amen. There's just too much to know in the world. There's too much in theology to know. I agree. To know everything about everything, or to know a lot about everything, or really to know anything about everything. <laughs> you have to find whatever you want to major in. <laughs> I was talking with someone the other day. You've got to find what you want to major in. What, what's going to be your field of expertise? Because it's just so vast that you can easily spread yourself too thin trying to jump over here and jump over there. Amen. Well, anyway, there were three factions in the Council of Trent that had three different opinions on what we should do with regard to these extra books. Three factions. We want to discuss those factions. In other words, these 53 men were divided up into three factious groups who had three different opinions, the third being the largest group and therefore the winning group because majority always wins. The first group said this is what we, we need to do. They were, I guess you could say, the moderates. We'll try to give them a name here, the moderates. Some of them wanted to draw up a list of books used by the church without passing a decree as to their status. So in other words, that was kind of what had been going on all along. There was a certain list of books. Luther even included them, remember, in his 1534 edition of the German Bible certain list of books that were used in the church and let's don't get into the matter of passing judgment on the relative status or the relative value of these books let's just draw up a list and leave the list as be and we'll be fine from there and these people wanted to base their beliefs upon those of Augustine so they are the Augustinian middle group we could say they were the ones who tried to hold the peace then there was a second group of the Catholic prelates who wanted to draw two lists. You could call these the radicals. You could call these the semi-reformers. <laughs> they wanted to follow Jerome. They said, let's draw up two lists, one of canonical books and one of those books used just for the purpose of edification. So we have our moderates who want to take kind of a, a middler position and follow Augustine. Let's have a long list, but let's don't be too technical about whether or not it's actually <laughs> canonical or scriptural. Let's just have the list. Then secondly, you've got your radicals, those who were leaning toward the Protestant view at this time, the reformers view, who were trying to follow Jerome and would want to draw two lists, one of canonical books, one of ecclesiastical. So your Augustinian group, your Jerome group, and then thirdly, the largest party, and the party who won, wanted to forget about these lists, the first list, and not pass any judgment on their relative value, or double lists that would show our books are not canonical, but let's just include all of these books in canonical scripture with the exception of three. The books of Esdras, first and second, or to the Catholics, they were always third and fourth, because Ezra and Nehemiah were first and second Esdras, and the prayer of Manasseh. They won, and so on April the 8th, 1546, was signed into Catholic law the decree of Sacrosancta, which reads as follows. The Synod doth receive and venerate all the books, as well of the Old as of the New Testament, since one God is the author of both. Also, the unwritten traditions, here it must have been the fourth session that the tradition rule was dealt with. Also, the unwritten traditions pertaining to faith and morals, as proceeding from the mouth of Christ, are dictated by the Holy Spirit, with an equal feeling of piety and reverence. Now you might say, well, I don't see any reference there to the Apocrypha. Well, they're not going to list them as the Apocrypha. <laughs> you don't want to say these are Apocryphal books. They're part of the Old Testament. We just read we accept all of the Old Testament as well as all of the New. So where is the Apocrypha? It's in the Old Testament. 
Those were Old Testament books written by Jewish people, hopefully at least written in the Hebrew language so we have some type of footing upon which we can stand. Now they give a whole list of the Old Testament books and mixed in with that you'll find Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, and the two books of Maccabees. We've given you before the seven books that the Catholics say they accept. And then a list of the new about which no disputation had ever really arisen in the past. Okay, after this statement that I've just read, the fact that they receive and venerate all Old Testament books, which include the seven of, Tob seven of Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, and the two books of Maccabees, then we have the conclusion to Sacrosancta. If anyone does not receive these books entire, comma, with all their parts, comma, now, Green has suggested, and I certainly feel that it's true, the reason that little phrase was stuck in there was so that we know that they include the four additions in the Old Testament. Three additions to Daniel, the Song of the Three Holy Children, the Prayer of Azariah, the History of Susanna, and the History of the Destruction of Bel and the Dragon, as well as the additions to the Book of Esther. Now, if you add those four to the seven they say they accept, you end up with the eleven that we've given you before. They say, no, we don't accept the whole apocrypha for just seven of those. No, 11 of those, to be technically correct, as they even say themselves, all the parts as well. And parts, in a sly way, is letting us know, now, we accept the additions to Esther as well as the three additions to the book of Daniel. And, of course, 11, that gives you three more to get to 14, they don't accept. The two books of Esther, third and fourth, as well as the prayer of Manasseh. If anyone does not receive these books entire with all their parts, as they are accustomed to be read in the Catholic Church, and knowingly and intelligently, <laughs> don't be intelligent, despise the traditions aforesaid, then let this man be anathema. So that's what we're doing, knowingly and intelligently despising the traditions of the aforesaid. And, you know, this is something, we're talking about something that's 400 years old, this Council of Trent. And it's valid and true down to this day. You former Catholics, if you're knowingly and intelligently despising the traditions aforesaid, you are anathematized Hallelujah. at this point and forevermore according to the decree of Sacrosancta. Thank you, Jesus. Well, you see, what's so ridiculous about this is that why did they ever think of this before? Why not pass one of these great laws? They had had many councils. This is the 19th council that the Catholics count up, the 19th ecumenical council of the Christian church. Why not think of this before? Well, it was never a problem until the reformers came along and said, now, these books are not much better than Aesop's fables. We've got to get these books out of the Bible. So... And, and the reformers, I'll tell you what, I mean, the Reformation was sent from heaven just like the Spirit was on the day of Pentecost. You can be certain of that. Because, I mean, it spread like wildfire. The Catholic Church had held people in tomb now for so many centuries. How could you ever get people out of that? Well, it'd take God. It'd take a miracle to open the eyes of some of these leaders like Luther and Zwingli and Beza and Calvin and get people to be willing to listen to them because all of Europe, I mean, let's face the facts, all of Europe was a Catholic Europe. To get all of these people to listen to renegades like Luther and Calvin and Bees and Zwingli. Praise God. Well, they did. And, of course, most of the high countries, those higher up, uh, just really took off in the Reformation. It was those lower down that were closer to Rome, Vatican City, obviously. Like Italy, Italy never became a Protestant country, and to this day it's not. Spain... Where is Spain on the map? Is it high up on the European continent or low? It's low. It's a Spanish country to this day. I mean, it's a Catholic country to this day. Portugal, Catholic country to this day. And, and that goes back to a message, where was it? Somewhere we dealt recently. We teach so much, I forget where we were because my mind's on this. But, oh, I know where that was back in Daniel. We are talking about the, uh, the Monroe Doctrine. I remember it fed in the Monroe Doctrine. Who was the one who colonized Central America, who colonized the, at least the northern part of South America? Well, people from Spain and people from Portugal. 
And that's why you end up with these as being great Catholic countries, like Argentina is a Catholic country. Brazil is a Catholic country. All the countries down there are Catholic countries. Well, it helps to know a little history so you can explain this. But it is interesting that it's, it's one of the most ridiculous things that's ever been done as far as intelligent people are concerned in the church. And yes, it is true that after this, Catholic theologians themselves, as I intimated earlier, had a lot of problem with this. Now, what the Catholic Church really did was pass a law concerning the use of the Vulgate. Uh, what we read here, I don't think, contained a statement about the Vulgate. But that was the issue of the law of sacrosancta, that you had to receive the Latin Vulgate as the official Bible of the church. Well, remember that the Latin Vulgate contained the Apocrypha. Uh, much to the disdain of Jerome, the translator of it, it nevertheless did contain the books of the Apocrypha. Oddly enough, they did not include the prayer of Manasseh or the two books of Esdras. No one knows exactly why, uh, because they had been read and had been used in the church down until this time. But in 1592, when the new Vulgate edition came out, that was another thing the Council of Trent was concerned about, to publish a new revised edition of the Vulgate. They decided to during the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563, and it finally came out in the year 1592. And at the end of the New Testament, you see, we still have copies. I don't, but we, scholars in general, have copies, libraries somewhere have copies of these very Bibles. At the end of the New Testament, the prayer of Manasseh and First and Second Esdras were placed with a note tacked on, leave them here lest they should perish from neglect. Twenty years later, they were moved in the new English edition to the end of the Old Testament. Now in 1592, we're talking about a Latin Bible. But about 20 years later, the so-called Reims Douay version came out, which was the first important Catholic English version of the Bible. And we'll discuss the uh, Reims Douay version later on. But it moves the prayer of Manasseh and the third and fourth book of Esdras to the end of the Old Testament, where I guess more properly they should be placed, not at the end of the New Testament. And the other books were scattered throughout the Old Testament canon. Remember, Jerome had tried to separate everything. But in the new edition of the Vulgate in 1592, the books are scattered throughout the Old Testament canon to make it appear as though they were to officially and popularly speaking be regarded as part of canonical scripture. And don't forget that the primary reason for this all really was not just on the basis of existing usage. We gave you two bases uh, because you can just keep on doing your thing as far as existing usage is concerned without passing any laws. The primary reason is because of the Reformation. And the Council of Trent was a product of the Counter-Reformation to counter what the Reformers and the Reformation had done to the stronghold of Catholicism on the continent of Europe. Okay, that's fairly important that you remember that, that you have that. We're going to move on to some other things, but the Council of Trent is what brings the watershed and what brings all of the heated discussions. There are many discussions, generally without much light, but rather with a lot of heat, regarding the Apocrypha. Because if you were Catholic, you were bound now by the decree of Sacrosancta to accept it. If you're a Protestant, well, you're not bound to accept it, and we'll see in the earlier years you're not bound to reject it either. You're kind of trying to follow what the Reformers had taught, but remember as we showed you last time, the Reformers didn't exactly know what to do about all this. It was a new ball game to them. Just to throw out these books that had been there now for centuries and centuries was a fairly big step to take. So it was something that they had to consider. So let's move on to, I think we're on reference number 32. And what happened with regard to the counter 
counter-reformation. The Protestants said their spill, Council of Trent, reacted against that. Now what happened to the Protestants after the Council of Trent? This we'll find very interesting. So number 32, we'll look at the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible of 1560. One thing I think you're going to find to be very interesting later on in this class, we've been going, we're way up into the 80s, I think, on messages now in literature, and you've learned a lot in these messages, haven't you? It gives you a whole, whole introduction to the Bible in all different phases. That's why we call it introduction to uh, biblical literature and extra biblical as well. But I think one section that you'll be very, very interested in will be whenever we get to the Bible versions and the Bible translations of the last few hundred years, bringing right up to the most recent ones. Uh, it's very enlightening to know something about these Bibles, why they were translated, who did the translating, what type of theology they have, and how they've so greatly and tremendously affected the world since then. Some, of course, more than others, such as the King James Version of the Bible. Now, the King James Version of the Bible is 350 years old. But well, think of the influence that it has had upon the whole world, not just Europe or not just North America, but upon the whole world. So we'll study that. We'll look at the different men on the committee of the King James Version. It's very interesting. But one Bible to begin with now is the Geneva Bible that was translated in the year 1560 by a group of scholars in Geneva. We'll give you more background, much more background to all of this later on, but let's just summarize a few things right now. Mary Tudor, do you remember the Tudors in the English throne? Mary Tudor, more popularly referred to as Bloody Mary, came to the English throne as queen in the year 1553. For the continuation of this message, please turn the tape over. Mary Tudor, do you remember the Tudors in the English throne? Mary Tudor, more popularly referred to as Bloody Mary, came to the English throne as queen in the year 1553. Another thing you can, well, I'll take a pause. You better not pause. You better keep writing because I'm going to speed up in a moment. <laughs> One thing that you'll find out as far as church history is concerned is you have to have a very intimate knowledge of all that's going on in the courts of the European kings and queens because that has so much interplay with what goes on in Catholicism as well as in the Reformation. But Mary Tudor comes to the throne in 1553 and as I said she's more popularly known as Bloody Mary because of her strongly pro-Catholic view and her strongly anti-Protestant view she has many many people murdered and as a matter of fact, because of her murderous reign as Queen of England, that doesn't last long. She finally is deposed of in 1558, I believe. But a whole host of Reformation scholars have to flee across the English Channel from England back to the continent. And many of these end up settling back in the important Reformation city of Geneva, Switzerland. Calvin and his friend Theodore Bisa had made Geneva in Switzerland one of the, the most important cities as far as the Western European Reformation was concerned. Luther made Germany a stronghold, Calvin and Beza made Switzerland, particularly its capital Geneva, the stronghold. So some of these scholars end up, many of these scholars end back up in Geneva for this short period while Mary Tudor is queen, queen in England. Two of these scholars were Theodore Beza, B-E-Z-A, Calvin's friend, as well as William Whittingham, who was married to the sister of the wife of John Calvin. So both of these, you can see, were in some way, either by marriage or by friendship, were related to Calvin. Beza was a friend of his. Theodore Beza was probably the most outstanding scholar during this period of time and William Whittingham was married to the sister of the wife of John Calvin. These two men, as well as others, are responsible for the translation of the Geneva Bible. This was the Bible of William Shakespeare, 
was a very famous Bible, very popular. It was the most popular Bible, the most popular English Bible to continue uh, for about 40 years or about 50 years, as a matter of fact, up until the time of the King James Version. And even with the King James Version, many people didn't follow that, didn't go for that like the Puritans. They held to the Geneva Bible, so it stayed very important for a number of decades. We'll discuss all of that in a lot more detail later on. But you know that William Shakespeare is always quoting from the Bible in his play. So it was the Bible. Uh, the King James Version wasn't written by this time. We don't, that doesn't come along until 51 years later. But it was the Bible of William Shakespeare. It was the Bible of John Bunyan, made famous by his various works like of Pilgrim's Progress and Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. It was the Bible of Oliver Cromwell's army, famous, famous English general and statesman. And it was the Bible of the pilgrims as well. Now, the Geneva Bible rejects the canonical status of the Apocrypha. It would appear, but does it really? It's an interesting question here. I think that we have the answer because I think page numbers give us the answer. The pilgrims rejected the canonical status of the Apocrypha, and they used the Geneva Bible. So could the pilgrims really be using a Bible that would be in favor of the Apocrypha? Well, a couple of points about the Geneva Bible. It did have one interesting novelty in it. It alone of English Bibles had the prayer of Manasseh stuck between 2 Chronicles and Ezra. Now you see, most Bibles, if they're going to have the Apocrypha, if it's a Reformation Bible, they're going to be grouped together at the end of the Old Testament or at the end of the New, the end of the whole Bible. But because probably of the connection between the so-called prayer of Manasseh and the account that we have of Manasseh's repentance in Second Chronicles, it was placed between Second Chronicles and Ezra. However, in the table of contents, it is listed as the prayer of Manasseh, comma, apocryphy, which must have meant this is what they thought of it. But did the Geneva Bible have the Apocrypha? What was its view about the Apocrypha? We're talking now about uh, a few years after the Council of Trent. We're talking about a Bible being produced in a Protestant Reformation stronghold, Geneva, Switzerland. Well, it does have the Apocrypha. But I want to read you a preface that introduces the section that contains the Apocrypha. It reads as follows, these books that follow in order after the prophets unto the New Testament are called Apocrypha. That is, books which were not received by a common consent to be read and expounded publicly in the church, neither yet serve to prove any point of Christian religion, save inasmuch as they had consent of the other scriptures called canonical to confirm the same, or rather whereon they were grounded. In other words, I, when we studied the Apocrypha before, we come across some statement. I said, believe that, do that, follow that, because that's right in Proverbs or right in Ecclesiastes. Amen. So this is valid and true only because it has its basis somewhere back in the Old Testament. But as books proceeding from godly men were received to be read for the advancement and furtherance of the knowledge of the history and for the instruction of godly manners. Which books declare that at all times God had an especial care of his church? Now, he probably, they probably here have reference to the books of Maccabees, that God was watching over his church at all times. Um, You've got to realize that most people during this time, and only, it's, it's only because of the dispensational views of, um, well, that have been popularized, uh, in the Schofield Reference Bible that people today don't refer to Israel as the church, but Calvin, time and time again, talks about Israel as the old church of God. So most people referred to Israel as the ancient church of God. So when he says, which books declare that at all times God had an especial care of his church, he probably means the Jews, the Old Testament. And left them not utterly destitute of teachers and means to confirm them in the hope of the promised Messiah, and also witness that those calamities that God sent to his church 
were according to his providence, who had both so threatened by his prophets and so brought it to pass for the destruction of their enemies and for the trial of his children. So the point is the Geneva Bible, the original Geneva Bible, does indeed contain the Apocrypha. All of it, with the exception of the prayer of Manasseh, is relegated to a little section at the end of the Old Testament. That section being prefaced with these remarks which I have just read. However, in uh, 1599, 1560s a date for the Bible, in 1599, it doesn't contain the books of the Apocrypha. It is the earliest English Bible to exclude the Apocrypha. Now, other Bibles had separated the Apocrypha at the end of the Old Testament, and it appears like this is what Geneva Bible is doing. But by 1599, it's not there. However, according to the page numbers, something's missing. And according to the table of contents, the books were to be there. So we've got a problem of a thief somewhere in between the writing of it all the printing of it all and it being distributed. Well, what comes in between the printing of it all and people getting it in their hands? The binders, the people who are responsible for binding all of it together. So obviously the binders must have been close friends of Calvin, Bisa, Luther, Whittingham and the rest of them. And they slipped pages of the Bible out. A very interesting in history and we're going to come across that again with the King James Version of the Bible. So that's interesting. In 1599, Certain copies of Geneva Bible were missing the Apocrypha. And you see, the binders couldn't do anything about the page numbers because that was the printer's responsibility. And if they print up to page 1,000, and the New Testament is supposed to start with 1,001, but instead New Testament starting with 1,500, then you're missing 500 pages in there. You can't say, well, the binders are dumb because they should have changed the page numbers. They couldn't do that. The printers were responsible for that. But if you've got all the material before, you just slip those pages out that you don't want in there. So they did. Now, I, facetiously, I'm saying they were probably friends of Calvin and Luther. Luther's not around now anyway, but it may have been just because of the fact that people were so excited over a new English edition of the Bible, and so many of the common people wanted them, that they wanted Bibles that were less bulky and that were not quite as expensive as it would be otherwise. However, why would you choose to pick out the Apocrypha, though? Unless you already had problems with the Apocrypha to begin with. Why not just take out the New Testament? Or, or the Law of Moses or something. Why pick those books out unless you've got some problems with it? The first deliberate attempt, editorially, to leave them out was in 1640 in the edition published at Amsterdam. I mean, this attempt was deliberate, but not on the basis of the editors. So the first deliberate attempt, editorially speaking, to exclude the Apocrypha from an English Bible was the Geneva edition of 1640 published in Amsterdam. So in other words, here's our point. We're going to move on to the next thing here in a moment. But here's our point. The Council of Trent has come along and passed the decree of Sacrosancta in 1546, saying that these books are canonical. The Protestants in a stronghold city like Geneva come right along and publish a Bible, put the Apocrypha right in it. Why? Well, one thing we can see is the Protestants aren't so blinded like the Catholics seem to be at this time just over the hatred for one's enemies or they would just really want to react against the apocrypha and reject it from their bible in order to prove we're not catholics but they're just following what reformers and what people before the so-called reformation had even erupted what they had done all along was to include the books of the apocrypha and stick them in the bible stick them in there somewhere preferably like Luther did in the 1534 German Bible of his at the end of the Old Testament. Next thing we come to, what are we on, 33 then? The Belgic Confession. 
the Belgic Confession of 1561. We're looking at this chronologically, so we're a year later. The Belgic Confession of 1561, Articles 4, 5, and 6. Article 4 is entitled, Canonical Books of the Holy Scriptures. So we would obviously think we could read this and come up with a good idea of what their position was. Canonical books of the Holy Scriptures. We believe that the Holy Scriptures are contained in two books, namely the Old and New Testaments, which are canonical. You say, well, that's what the Catholics believe. So that doesn't tell us everything. Article 5. Whence do the Holy Scriptures derive their dignity and authority? We receive all these books. Which books? Well, I just skipped over the whole list of all the Old Testament and all the New Testament with none of the Apocrypha included. We receive all these books and these only as holy and canonical. Article 5. But then what we really want is Article 6 entitled The Difference Between the Canonical and Apocryphal Books. The Belgic Confession reads as follows. We distinguish these sacred books from the apocryphal, that is, the third and fourth book of Estrus, the books of Tobias, Judith, Wisdom, Jesus, Sirach, Baruch, the appendix to the book of Esther, the song of the three children in the furnace, the history of Susanna, of Bel and the dragon, the prayer of Manasseh, and the two books of Maccabees, all which the church may read and take instruction from so far as they agree with the canonical books. But they are far from having such power and efficacy as that we may from their testimony confirm any point of faith or of the Christian religion, much less to detract from the authority of the other sacred books. Remember one of, the, one of the testimonies, one of the tests, that rather, concerning the canonical status of a book was, is this book efficacious? Does it have the power to change a man whenever he reads and meditates upon the book? That was one of the five tests. Is the book <coughs> efficacious? Does it have power to change a man? Mm -hmm. And they're saying the Apocrypha doesn't have any power to change anybody. Hallelujah. But they're saying the Holy Scriptures do. They have power and they're efficacious. Number 34, the 39 Articles of the Church of England, 1562. The 39 Articles of the Church of England. The sixth article reads as follows. Well, I tell you what, I have to go back to, well, it's all in the sixth, entitled of the sufficiency of the Holy Scriptures for salvation. In the name of Holy Scripture, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament of whose authority was never any doubt in the churches. And then a little section entitled of the names and number of the canonical books, and it gives a list of all of the Old Testament books, and nowhere in that list are found any of the apocryphal. It doesn't give a list of the New Testament books because, remember, they were never really disputed. And after, after this list of the Old Testament books, the ones that we now accept, we read as follows here in the end of the sixth article. And the other books, as Jerome says, the church doth read for example of life and instruction of manners but yet doth it not apply them to establish any doctrine. And you'll see this is the recurring position even of the reformers up for a long period of time. It's the books are fine to learn from historically. They're fine from, as long as they don't deviate from Scripture, they're fine for your manner of life. I've said before, you can base your manner of life on many things in Ecclesiasticus. They said they're fine for that. They're fine to be read in church but they cannot establish any doctrine. That's why a person, you can have a position like that 
and really not be afraid of it or of ever being led astray by it because if this if these books are not to establish any doctrine then anywhere where the scriptures contradict them then you'd have to leave the apocryphal alone but anywhere the scriptures are in agreement with them the scriptures themselves have already established that doctrine the apocrypha is just repeating it therefore to follow the apocrypha would be to follow the scripture although be careful about that and how you turn things you know if you say i follow the apocrypha today uh, you best not say that and so they list the books third and fourth estrus tobit judith rest of the book of hester you know it's all spelled in the old-fashioned book of wisdom jesus son of sirach baruch song of the three children story of susanna bell and dragon prayer of manasseh first and second maccabees all the books of the new testament as they are commonly received we do receive and accept them as canonical so that's the church of england's position in 1562 however there is a little catch to this they say that as jerome believes so we believe that these books are not canonical and therefore we don't accept them in our canon but when you get over to article 35 there are 39 articles here when you get over to article 35 Article 35 makes a reference to the two books of homilies, you know, sermons from some past famous quote-unquote divines. Uh, this, this refers particularly to the second, I believe. Article 35 reads, the second book of homilies, the several titles whereof we have enjoined under this article, doth contain a godly and wholesome doctrine. Second book of homilies, doth contain a godly and wholesome doctrine. Now, in these two books of homilies, there are 33 homilies found. 19 of these 33 homilies have 80 quotations or references to all of the apocryphal books with the exception of first and second estrus and second maccabees i'll read that again these two books of homilies contain 33 homilies 19 of these contain collectively 80 quotations or references to all apocryphal books except the two books of estrus and second maccabees And our problem lies in the fact that this second book of homilies, and he includes here, they include rather, the first book, which has already been mentioned. These two books of homilies contain, and I'm quoting, a godly and wholesome doctrine. So in other words, we're almost, we're almost hearing something out of two sides of the mouth. The six articles said, we believe just like Jerome does, these books are not canonical. But by the time you get over to Article 35, and we've got this little cryptic reference to these two books of homilies that, that the Church of England had based a lot upon at this time, ministers took sermons from that and took beliefs, you know, from that. Then when you've got so many, 19 out of 33, that contain 80 quotations to the apocryphal books, all except three, the two books of Estrus and Second Maccabees. And that's not what's important. What's important is they are described as containing wholesome and godly doctrine well does that cover those 80 quotations from the apocrypha or does it not you see we're not told here so to, to to me it doesn't present a problem it just shows me that this is typical of the spirit of the age it's typical of what's going on you don't even know, know exactly what to do in one sense you know that the reformers are right calvin was right in rejecting the apocrypha in spirit you know that's true but in practice well sometimes we end up with a different matter okay let's go on to number 35 35 will be interesting 35 King James Version of the Bible 1611 I'm not really going to try to give you any history of the King James Version since we will study that in a lot of detail but we're just going to look at it tonight with regard to the Apocrypha so a lot of this we won't have to repeat whenever we study it, its origin, the men who were on the committee, and the success of the King James Version since then. 
the so-called authorized Bible, although that's a misnomer. It was never authorized by anybody. But you'll even read in your Bible, on some Bibles, the authorized version. It wasn't authorized. King James Version is the best name. What, what did the King James Version do? Now, what the King James Version did in 1611 is not necessarily what you have in your Bible now because you've got addition from many editions later. Well, just like we could probably surmise ahead of time, the King James Version grouped all of the apocryphal books at the end of the Old Testament. But it was rather interesting in this regard. It left them there without a note or without a preface. In other words, it almost was as though they did not even want to take the time to deal with them. But they did translate them. There was so many men on the committee, we'll study this later, and they were divided up between Oxford and Cambridge, different cities like that. There were three committees, and so many dealt with Old Testament, so many with New Testament, and so many men dealt in translating the Apocrypha. But they're grouped together at the end of the Old Testament with no note or preface. The only thing that they are given is a title, just the simple word Apocrypha. And in a departure from Luther's semi-mistake of his German Bible of 1534, which remember uh, Luther's German Bible had a colophon at the end of the Apocrypha, the end of 2 Maccabees, that read, this is the end of the Old Testament. And you'd think you should have that colophon following Malachi and not following 2 Maccabees. And, and Luther made a mistake there. Or we won't say necessarily, I said a semi-mistake. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that Luther believed something different than what someone else during that time, like Calvin, would believe about the Apocrypha. But it's either just a mistake that was made as far as, well, I forgot to put it there, or it's no big deal. This is the end of this whole block of Scripture we call Old Testament. And I know that I've added in the apocryphal books in between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, but so what? In other words, what I'm saying is the King James Version of the Bible put the little statement, the end of the Old Testament, after Malachi. And whenever you get to the end of the Apocrypha, after 2 Maccabees, then you have a little statement, the end of the Apocrypha. So interesting sidelight to the book. But the King James Version itself had a peculiarity. In the original 1611 edition, a lot of people don't realize this, but it had a small number of marginal references. You've got many in your editions today. But there were a small number of marginal references in the original edition. And it's interesting to find that many of these refer to the Apocrypha. They direct the reader's attention to some apocryphal passage. There are about 113 that direct your attention to the Apocrypha. 102 were in the Old Testament and 11 were in the New. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. 102 were in the Old Testament, 11 in the New. And I'm going to give you the 11 in the new. You can shout or something that I'm not going to give you the 102 in the Old Testament. The 11 in the new. Matthew 6, 7 led you to Ecclesiasticus 7, 14. That's the one about don't repeat your prayers. Matthew 23, 37 directed your attention to 2nd Estrus 1.30. Uh, that is the one about Jesus saying, I would gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But remember that the first chapter of 2nd Estrus comes after the New Testament period and not before. You have to go back and study your notes there for that, that we've got additions to 2nd Estrus that were written after Christian times. And they were building upon the New Testament, not the New Testament quoting from the Apocrypha. So evidently, the men on this committee also didn't know their history in some areas, and they weren't aware of the fact that the first chapter of 2nd Estrus came after the time of the Gospel of Matthew. Then Matthew 27, 43, 
led you to wisdom 2 15 to 16 we I don't I don't really want to take the time to discuss all these but that doesn't even relate Matthew 27 43 is a quotation from Psalm 22 Luke 6 31 do unto others, do unto as you would have them do unto you. Tobit 4.15, the negative statement of that. Luke 14.13, led you to Tobit 4.7. You see, if you look these places up in your Bible out there tonight, you won't have any apocryphal references there. But you did back in the original edition. Now, that Tobit 4.7, maybe that should be connected to the Luke 11 passage, but it was connected to the Luke 14. John 10, 22, the Feast of Dedication, correctly connected to 1 Maccabees 4:59. Romans 9, 21, the passage about the potter and the clay, connected to Wisdom 15, 7. But it should be to some other, some other passage like Isaiah or Jeremiah. Romans 11:34, who has known the mind of the Lord, who hath been his counselor, to wisdom 913 but that also can be found in the Old Testament here's one we never covered before 2 Corinthians 9 7 Paul says if you give and give cheerfully well Ecclesiasticus 35 9 says that God loves a cheerful giver Hebrews 1 3 that difficult passage to wisdom 726 and Hebrews 11.35 to 2 Maccabees 7.7. 7. So it contains the Apocrypha grouped at the end of the Old Testament. However, it also left these books out altogether as early as the 1626 edition. It was done again in 1629, again in 1630, and again in 1633. But this, like the Geneva Bible, was done by the binders. We can tell by the page numbers that something has been left out. Left out by the binders. Then in 1615, the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, who was a strong Calvinistic member of the King James Version Committee, published a statement that Bibles from this time forth must contain the Apocrypha upon the pain of one year in prison. Because that had simply been the history up until this time. 